really? your patience. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is about time temporality, so we have a build up of suspense. Yeah, it's part of the content. Yeah, it's a model. <laughs> yeah. It's a metalogue. Yeah, very good. Come on, Paul. Oh, you ready? Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks a lot for bracing the fires, the elements, Prometheus, to join us at uh, this wonderful symposium. I am delighted um, to, have, to welcome the panel, which I will do with a little bit more detail later. But I would like to start, maybe for two, three minutes, just giving a very brief outline about the symposium itself and our reasoning behind it. The title is Expanding Social Theory, Implications for Management Strategy and Organizational Studies. And we are grateful for Strategizing Activities and Practices Interest Group and the OMT division for sponsoring this. And in a way, it's quite beautiful to have these labels together, strategy, activities, theory, management, organization, because they belong together. It's expansive in itself, and the idea of expansion is, I think, what underlies the whole idea of this panel. Expansion on the one hand, oops, sorry, intellectually, an expansion that reaches out from organization studies and strategy into adjacent fields, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, and so on, but expansion also physically from articles to books. So this is a collection of books, monographs being written, um, that somehow try to perhaps spend a bit more time outside of our field and come back uh, infused or maybe disappointed or in any size, shape, or form having dealt with something on the outside. I think the little quote from uh, Sloterdijk uh, is, is not at all an unproblematic thinker, and the quote is not unproblematic. But the idea that reading the right books calms the inner beast is one that associates books and the apparatus of reading with the ideal of humanism. Humanism as that which separates the cultured from the barbaric, and reading and books as a central element in this distinction, the creation of a, an advanced society. And so, the cultivated humans through books against the feral beasts gives us something that calms. And I think we are in need of calming. Our time is particularly problematic, perhaps. We've got fake nukes, algorithmic control, simulations, robotics, real wars, trade wars, the Anthropocene, climate change, We've got Brexit, where I'm coming from. We've got refugee crisis, populism, the growing replacement of institutions and old corporations, as a, and old institutions by corporations and hidden networks, automation processes, what Sigmund Baumann called uh, the liquid modernity condition. So we need calming, perhaps. But the Slotetics quote is also a warning, because what we do with books is perhaps revive a humanistic ideal. And perhaps humanism is what is at stake as such. Is the condition post-human? What, what role can books play in a condition that is no longer about the recovery of humanity itself? So I think that's quite a lot to ask. But I think the panel here still believes in books. Well, I hope so. Um, it would be a waste of time otherwise. And so what we want to do, I think, is not just talk about the content of the book, but also very briefly about why we think it is relevant, why every one of us try to engage in the book, and then talk a little bit about what it means for, or could mean, perhaps, for the academy. So, it's my great delight to introduce the panel. Um, on my left is Ted Chatsky. He's a professor of geography and philosophy at the College of the Arts and Sciences at the University of Kentucky. Uh, Ted has written five books, I think, um, two of which are very close to my own thinking, I did my PhD, the 1996 book uh, on Wittgensteinian practices and the 2002 book uh, on site ontology. And they've become quite fundamental elements of what we call practice theory and organization management strategy, entrepreneurship, inclusion, diversity, and so on. I'm delighted to have a look at The second author, oh, I should move on as well, that would help with it. Um, the second book is by Robin Holden Mee. Um, Robin Holt is a professor, he can't be with us, I'm afraid, but he's a professor at CBS. Uh, he's just published a book on judgment, but he may be better known for a book he did with Robert Gia in 2009 on strategy without design. 
in Sesselo. Uh, I might solo. We've got next uh, Philippe Lorineau. Philippe is a distinguished emer uh, emer emeritus professor in accounting and management control department at ESSEC Business School in Paris. He's got a background in mathematics and engineering, and he has huge experience practically as well as theoretically in areas of cost control, accounting, shop floor management, and what we could call quite loosely, or I would call logistics. And logistics comes from logic. <laughs> and to counteract the invasion of logic too much, he's also interested in pragmatism and Bactinian dialogism, and in particular the work of Dewey and James. And I'm absolutely delighted to have you here. And modesty, of course, will forbid you to, for you to say it, but his book has just won the Eagles Best Book Prize. So we are absolutely delighted you will talk about this. Um, then we've got Paul Speer. Uh, Paul is the Associate Professor at the University of Queensland. He has published a number of articles that are <coughs> circulated widely, wide, wildly, of course, wildly and widely in the social studies community. Um, he did an ex extensive empirical <coughs> ethnography of the reinsurance and trading industry that was somewhat conveniently located in between London and the Bahamas, I take it. <laughs> yes. Very good. Okay, I'm delighted. I'm really grateful for the panel to be here. I'm grateful for you all to be here. What we do is, we thought we'd do 15 minutes each. Paul will take the time and not just, um, if you have urgent questions at the end of presentation, that's okay, but if we could sort of otherwise just memorize them and note them, and we've got quite a bit of time at the end to have a, an open discussion. Thank you very much. I hand over to Ted. All right, thanks, Michael. Um, I only once, just move it up. Yeah. Uh, oops, so there's a top half of this. Yes, that one. That's the more relevant half. But uh, the bottom pot half is the book. Um, unfortunately, I have not organized my comments around books per se, uh, though I could have. Um, instead, uh, they're organized more around social theory. So in the title, Expanding Social Theory, <clears throat> I'm responding to several questions that uh, Paul sent to us um, to be the common reference points. And so uh, I won't really get the books to the end. Um, so the first question is that Paul asked was, why engage social theory? And so that's org studies. Why should organizational studies engage social theory? Oh, and um, I forgot my entire introduction here. I was so excited to start. So I have to first say, before continuing, that uh, I'm really pleased to have been asked to be part of this panel and, very, even, and equally pleased to be back at this meeting. And I should say a brief word about who I am, because it's relevant. So I describe myself as a philosophical social theorist. I uh, was trained as a philosopher and was in a philosophy department for a long time. And uh, after a stint in the dean's office, have gone back to a geography department. So I'm in a social science department now. And I'm sort of a fish out of water in either place. Um, and that's kind of relevant to my take on these questions. OK, so my answer to the question why org studies should engage social theory is very quite, it's quite simple. It should because org, sci, org studies is a social science. And all social sciences should engage with social theory. Um, it's a social science because it studies social phenomena. In its case, its principal, though not sole, objects of study are organizations, right? And everything that is connected to them. So that, of course, encompasses quite a bit. Could be people, activity, technologies, institutions, systems. And what makes it a science, or really Wissenschaft, is that it goes about studying systematically and methodically. And to me, that's what comprises a science. And it, of course, means there's good sense to the term the human sciences uh, understood as the humanities. Now, the second bullet point there under number one, there are two key features for present purposes of, of the social disciplines, the social, social Wissenschaften. And first, they are multidisciplinary. Now, I don't mean by this simply that there is a bunch of them. You know, so we have a divisions called the social sciences, and there are multiple disciplines. 
Rather, I mean that they connect up with one another. They are not islands unto themselves, but are stitched together in a variety of ways to, for, to form a continuous fabric of knowledge and research um, and teaching. And um, so, for instance, the subject matters studied by practitioners in take all the social sciences together, these objects connect, are sometimes the same, they sometimes, they're different aspects of the same phenomena, there may be phenomena that connect, and so forth. And we all know that methodology, methodologies cross disciplinary lines in all sorts of ways. Um, and so this, and not only this, ties the different disciplines together uh, into a, a nexus. And, and another very important dimension of what ties together is theory, or the theory dimension. And here one has to mark a distinction between more disciplinary specific theory um, and transdisciplinary theory. And it would be my claim that transdisciplinary theory has been growing in importance steadily over the past 40 or 50 years. Uh, I think back there was a time in like the first half of the 20th century where there was a reasonable amount of balkanization in theory in social sciences, but that is slowly, slowly changing. And what, what marks the difference between uh, disciplinary specific and transdisciplinary theory is what the, con the theory refers to, the reference points, the other theoretical reference points, and also you could say which empirical studies are referred to. And there is a convergence on a much broader range of common references, I think, than in a previous state of affairs where in fact there were multiple disciplinary streams where which were very internally self-referential. And that is, and of course disciplines vary on this, on how tr much they become part of the transdisciplinary network. But nonetheless, I do think is a fair observation that this has become much thicker. This is, this is now an, another important component, stitching the various social sciences together into a nexus. Um, I might add there is still some disciplinary insularity exists. I mean, to me, the great examples, and paradoxically, is economics, at least in this country. And largely, there are always exceptions, of course. Um, and and in, interestingly enough, increasingly so, at least in North America, political science is breaking off from the other social sciences and attempting to link on more to economics, but that's a whole other story. Okay, so social theory is relevant to organizational studies because um, uh, it's relevant to all social sciences. Okay, so what's social theory then? And that was the second question that Paul put to us. Um, so I have a very uh, terse uh, account definition of what social theory, uh, uh, social theory is simply general, abstract thought about social things. It's general, it's abstract, and it's about things social. That's, that's all social theory is. And obviously it can take a very wide variety of forms. There are, there are, there's one, the, the most major division, it seems to me, among social theories are between what we might call substantive and epistemological theories. So substantive theories are about some object or other, and epistemological theories are about the nature of the comprehension that can be had of those objects. Um, and this construal of theory, uh, I mean, for decades, theory was construed as explanatory theory, right? Theory was, uh, to theorize was to provide some schema, some framework, some laws, if you were lucky, some generalizations, just maybe a list of factors that, that would, could provide explanations of social phenomena and social changes. And now the definition I've given doesn't in any way deny there is such theory, but it points that the th realm of theory is much larger than collections of the types of things I just mentioned that provide theories. It includes, it will include ontologies, for instance. It will include one of the most important realms of theory is typologies. You know, different in, in like Max Weber was like the master of this. 
Um, and uh, what I call accounts, which is where you have sort of a schematic ac account of how some, something works, a domain, a particular phenomena you're interested in. Um, and OK, so um, it, and I'm trying to, how much time have I got? Um, six minutes and 26 seconds. OK, all right. I'm losing seconds by the moment. Um, so um, the, um, Maybe I'll just move on to, um, so if we think of, so social theory embraces general ideas about things social. I mean, it's a, in, uh, we, what's the pertinence of such sort of general ideas to empirical investigation? And here, I just wanted to mention three pertinences. The first, social theory provides concepts and ways of thinking with which researchers can conceptualize, describe, explain, and interpret their subject matters. And I think this is maybe the greatest service. And social theory spins out concepts which then people find useful or maybe find not useful and, uh, and then are employed uh, in their work. So that's a second pertinence is that theory umbrellas findings. So, you know, you could have a form there was a time when people advocate a kind of mindless empiricism, right? Where you sort of uh, a deeply positivistic era where you, the idea is, is you know, social science is almost in the fact collecting business, right? You can collect lots of facts, but then of course, then what? And of course, it's the job of theory, in a sense, to provide something uh, that allows you to organize the facts. And now there's a, a, a sort of more fluid and more uh, up-to-date way of putting this is to say it umbrellas findings. You know, you can study a lot of things. The theory is a way of collecting together and finding a place and showing the connections between and showing how the findings then relate to more general abstract concerns. Theory connects these things together. Okay, and the third thing, uh, it, the third pertinence is that theory suggests topics for investigation. And, and th this is, uh, I suppose, really important too, because identifying topics of this uh, identification is a big, a big deal. Okay, so um, let me, um, so let's move on to number three then. Why, and this was a question Paul asked too, why should org studies be concerned about our books? Well, I can only speak from my book, and as it says here, my book is one, good version of a good approach, practice theory. Now, I, I'm saying this not because I'm full of myself and, you know, I'm saying, you know, this is the truth. That's why. Good is a technical term. It is my view there are many good theories. It isn't one good theory. Now, what makes a theory a good one? A theory is good. There are two conditions in which a theory is a good one. First, it has to be useful to empirical researchers. That means the concepts it develops, that it trucks in, have to be useful to the people who are actually conceptualizing empirical phenomena, describing them, explaining them. And if theory can do that, it's good, regardless of what it's claiming about the world. Now that sets up some potential paradoxes, but the second criteria is that a theory must be rationally cogent rationally sensible. That is, it must be defensible argumentatively in the face of criticism. And so the claim is that there are going to be multiple theories that are good on this criteria. And for too long, the search for truth has le led us mistakenly to think there's only one true, true theory. I don't even think that's right. But let alone good theories, because good's better than true, that's something that we can talk about. But there are multiple good theories. And so I would just simply claim my theory is one of them, but there's a lot of other ones too. And this sets up an interesting question, which is in a world where there are multiple good theories, how do you know how to proceed? And that's another topic uh, for discussion. And so what specifically my uh, book, which why don't we put that book, uh, what that book in particular provides is it provides ideas about change, about what social phenomena are, about social change, about the role, uh, there's a lot about materiality in this book, and I think in a much 
hard, more hard-hitting way than I think most accounts we find in the social science about materiality. There's a lot about causality and about explanation. So that's the, sort of the theoretical framework, the topics. But then there are elaborated illustrations of the, of the use of these concepts to conceptualize and describe and ex explain. Um, and then there are criticisms of prominent but illusory explanatory resources. So there are critiques of the use, the use of the notions, notions like power, coevolution, dependence, mechanisms, relations, and also, since now my discipline is geography, the idea that understanding contemporary phenomena, especially contemporary phenomena that are somehow mediated by digital technologies, requires the postulation of new types of space. So that could be digital space or, more recently, topological space. So, All right, so finally, and how much time have I got? Okay, so fourth, implications. And this is where the books come in. Um, so what's the implication of this? Well, to me the implication is that theory has to be an integral part of graduate education throughout the social sciences and in org studies. And that means you got to take courses in it, not that you just, you know, learn quickly about it. It's important to understand what theory is, the varieties of theories, how it can inform research. And this, I think, requires a studied and steady approach. Um, interesting, and this, uh, books are, are a crucial part of this. Uh, this is not subject matter. I mean, there are, I don't think there are many, I was thinking about, you know, where does this leave the article if we're, if we're emphasizing the book? Um, it's interesting, it's like, where do you find theory written? You don't find much theory in articles, it seems to me. The theory is present in the articles, but the, the articles do not develop the theory. And I think a reason for this, of course, is that the space, there's a lot of space issues in the writing. But chapters, book chapters, do a lot of the work. So it's not like whole books, though that could be true too, but it's often chapters. And so if you think of, um, I mean, to me, always an interesting model here it is Giddens' book, uh, the uh, uh, not the Constitution of that, the Central Problems in Social Theory. It's such an interesting book methodologically, even though it's theory from beginning to end, but because he's got these chapters which are really, they're like, you know, really abstract general theory. And then he, in the subsequent chapters, go, runs through a set of prominent and well-known issues uh, in, in especially sociology, but not only, and applies the same theoretical framework to all these problems, providing a very unified picture. Now, one can talk a lot about, um, but that's an interesting, mo methodologically, it's very interesting. Um, and I think one finds similarly, I mean, theory can be <coughs> smeared across a whole book, or it might be concentrated in a chapter, but it does tend to be books where this is happening. It's almost like, Whatever you're going to do with a theory, you need sufficient space to run with it. And books provide that. Um, and um, so if it's important to have all this in graduate education, and then people will go on to write more books. And so then we'll keep books going. So anyway, <laughs> hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any immediate questions? Uh, is everyone able to contain themselves? <laughs> Paul, will you wait for me in just five minutes? <laughs> okay. Yeah, this one. So, talk about smearing theory over a few hundred pages. Uh, that's going to happen now. This is the book Robin and me have been working on for quite a while and we thought we combined writing the book with an empirical study of patients and Cambridge University Press have been our subject and they <laughs> sort of <laughs> at borderline. Are we almost there? So the book's going to come out next year with fi final touches and everything and it's entitled The Poverty of Strategy and poverty hopefully uh, uh, as much as it can fit into this presentation having a number of connotations and meanings. Um, and we thought we'd start off quite boldly by defining strategy. Um, That's right. 
And we say the strategy is the struggle of an organization to present itself to itself and others. Strategy is a process of self-knowing. All strategy starts with the question of who am I? Be it in terms of resources, be it in terms of distinction competitors, be it in terms of finding words to corral interest, self-knowing lies at the very center. And self-knowing, of course, is not easy, or we should at least assume that it's not easy enough. It has to be worked on. Um, and it is, in the definition of self-knowing, lies a question of a struggle for authenticity. Because to know oneself properly means to know oneself authentically. And so reaching out into social theory, into philosophy in particular, we feel we may find approaches and ways of questioning approaches to self-knowing that may have relevance for the ways in which we think about strategy. And we were quite surprised by this because we started off thinking there's one or two ways. Um, we've been working on this for 10 years and we realized that the first two ways that we thought about this are entirely insufficient. So what I'll very briefly try to do is present three ways in which we, in which we think self-knowing can be understood. And I will spend much more time on the third one that has encroached upon us, and I'll try to run quite briefly for the first two. The very first one is we can know ourselves through the political realm. Hannah Arendt is a guiding figure here, in particular human condition, in which she suggests that a strategoi, Greek figure that looks after city-state, does so authentically by means of being with others. It's a communal affair. It's a life in the polis, the Greek city-state. The Agora being the place in which we exchange ideas and act virtuously. But she also gives us a sense that this is quite a difficult task. In the human condition, she outlines three modes of being. The first is labor. This is a picture by Jean-François Millet, faggot gatherers returning from the woods. And we see that the bodies here are bent from the toil of carrying the wood. The figure in the background almost disappearing integrating into nature. We have a condition of the laborer that is not persisting. At the end of the day, the laborer consumes the, the fruits of the labor, gets him and herself consumed in the process. There's no trace left in history of the laborer. More authentically, we can think of ourselves as producing works, unlike the laborer's goods which are consumed or decay, Works persist, often outlive the lifespan of an individual. We make things, podests, these fancy machines. But they too are subject to fashion and trends. And they, even though they outlive the labor of the worker's life for some time, they are not eternal. They are not being retold in some indeed by the, um, by the bards that for the ancient Greeks held this capacity to keep life alive beyond the uh, biological lifespan. So there comes action. Action is then this capacity for authentic being in the polis, being with others. It is precisely leaving behind the oikon, the household, the economics, to live freely, dedicate oneself to life in the polis, like Pericles and many others, to act purely for the state and purely the interest of the city-state. This is authentic self-knowing. I know myself as part of a polis. However, there are many problems with this, in particular because it's a hugely exclusive, exclusive way of arguing, uh, of operating. Those in the police, the citizens, are free. They are free by virtue of being citizens. The slave, however rich, will never be free. The animal won't be free. Those who are excluded are excluded by virtue of who they are. There is no real progress and transit into freedom. The other point is, of course, economically, that the capacity leashed behind the oikon requires a slave state. Loads of problems with this kind of idyllic, almost romanticizing of the ancient Greek, we feel as a mode of self-knowing that falls on Hannah Arendt's world. So this is the first idea that we can know ourselves through polis. The next one, and this is where we thought we'd end up, is to know oneself through existence, not through the being with others, but to look inwardly. We can know ourselves if we really try hard. The picture here is by a chap called Jakob von Uxkill, a German biologist, whose work's been picked up by Heidegger, but also Deleuze, it's written by Tick, for example, quite famously. And the idea that 
there is a distinction in ways of being capable of looking inward. The stone, Heidegger argues, has no world. The animal is poor in world. It is locked into a disinhibitor ring where it has got its world. It is unmediated and connected to that world, but has not the capacity to reach out. Not even the lark sees the open. Not even that poetic figure that we sing about and listen to as a capacity to reach out, because it is poor in reaching out, but also rich in the proximity and unmediated beauty of being connected. The human being, on the other hand, and this is where it gets interesting, Heidegger speculates, is that being that has got the potential to know itself. The, the being that's got the possibility for the access to being. So one way of knowing yourself would be through maybe introspection. We don't quite know. But there are many, many problems about this. On the right-hand side, we see a picture of John Cage's prepared piano. And we think that symbolizes quite well the problem of the idea of self-knowing. Imagine a piece of music being played. At first we see the instruments on the stage, and then after a while we forget, we listen to the music. The prepared piano stops us from doing that. The instrument always asserts itself, because it sounds cranky, it makes noises. We're constantly looking at the instrument and then the music. It disturbs. We're not ever able to both live and look at ourselves at the same time. This is a condition that has been written about quite a lot, about the uncanny. That's unheimlich. That which continually turns us away from the capacity to know ourselves. Beautiful here, captured by Hölderlin's Antigone. Manifold is the uncanny, yet nothing uncannier than man bestirs itself. So we are constantly locked in this really eerie condition that we have got the capacity to make world and yet forever fall short of that potential. So again, we argue that is not a good way to think about self knowing, introspection. There are many problems, there are many more problems with Heidegger, especially since the black books, with the footnotes and that kind of stuff. But this is not the way. So what then? Well, let's think of a third way of self-knowing, and this is the one we ended up spending most of the time. Not just looking at being in a community, or being with oneself existentially, but what if our existence is always already mediated? What if we are technologically mediated? Why, what is there, there's, there's always the access to self-knowing is through something else. And here we play around with three epochs. And these are not, strictly speaking, historical epochs, even though they've got some sort of resemblance, or we can tie them into different time periods. On the left-hand side, we've got... Sorry, I need to make that bigger now. Uh, I'm getting old. OK, on the left-hand side, we've got technique. Techne, Aristotelian idea of techne, is where the artisan reaps or he cobbles together a few bits, a raft, and something to a pot, maybe reading the stars, trying to read celestial patterns, to read back a little bit, look, from the goddess of look, Tiki. The Greek goddess of look that's fickle and continually tries to throw problems into man's way. It's a humble condition, one that is local that is located, it's an ontology of presence, where the worker is intimately connected, connected with the work itself. Planning has its root etymologically in planting. So planting as a technique means to push the seedling into the ground with the sole of your foot. You have to be there to do that. It is where you and the work come together. Gilbert Simondon speaks quite nicely about the artisan who combines information and energy, where you can, what you can produce is limited to your strength and your cognitive capacities. It is all based on experience and intimate feedback. Energy and information go together. We insert ourselves through planning, tending, waiting, but we've got a possibility to create beautiful things, a silver chalice, the thing, something that gathers, and in gathering brings together nature a purpose, material, and a human being, rather than us imposing ourselves. This is what the Greeks called poiesis, bringing forth, herausbringing, herausbringing. The limits of this artisanship is precisely the body and the cognitive capacity. So it's local, it's close. It's orientation towards the future. And the problem is that we end up, perhaps, 
producing things that are not very good. Every technology brings a problem, a danger to it. Beryllium speaks quite nicely, but it's a train brings a train wreck, the plane, the plane crash. What this technique brings is that we just produce crap things. So its, pro its potential for disaster is fairly limited. And it's the human condition that is, that is driven by humidity. We know that we are weak against nature. And thus we know that what we produce is only ever provisionary. It will never ever control. We are much more in a condition that we then in the second epoch identify with technology. Unlike technique, technology is sort of indicated by the control room and the governor. The governor has this cybernetic idea of a flywheel that once accelerates, lifts up and, and disconnects the energy supply, the system slows down, keeps itself in a tolerance level. So the governor regulates. We no longer have circularity and celestial patterns, but uh, we have parallelity, sequentiality. We've got factories, tacting, tailorism, and the like. The world is therefore no longer experienced. It's represented. There's a beautiful cattle, well, meetings, it's General Motors and Sloan. General Motors has the company that post the railway transformation. First introduces cybernetic ideas into the running of the organization. Purely driven by information, no longer by energy. A separation emerges and production can be sped up. The limits are no longer the strength of the worker. The limits are information control. And with Moore's law, with the proliferation of filing systems, with the proliferation of punch cards and IBM comes into play, this is almost unlimited. So the dangers here are much greater. The danger here is thermonuclear war as the fulfillment of the rapid expansion of technology. The gigantic, the inframing as Heidegger calls it, where we always forever unlock, extract, store, switch over. In this repetitive cycle of exploiting nature and ourselves, and we ourselves become inframed. And this is deeply inauthentic, but there is a degree of potentiality in there. Heidegger calls it world making, but it's very tricky to see how this may happen as an authentic way of engaging. Hannah Arendt's husband, Ursula husband, uh, Günther uh, Anders, speaks of Promethean shame. No longer humble in this condition, but afraid to lack behind the beauty of the machine. The machine that doesn't rest. We become ourselves constantly embroiled in prosthetic extensions to be like the machine. We are afraid to lack behind. Thus we run around with smartphones and all these other sort of gadgets that make us almost like a machine. So we're constantly shameful. This is where we more or less are, we think, but we're, we're veering into the right. No longer technology, but technogenesis. Here we no longer have a control room or governance. We've got the, in, the indicative site, is the interface. Here we have no longer parallelity, we've got instantaneity. The machine, the digital machine, has got no time. It's got its own time, which is no time. It's immediate, it switches instantly. We no longer represent the world, a world is simulated to us. Wendy Chun speaks of sig uh, flickering signifiers. We look at screens where computers produce a world to us that has no reference to anything. This is purely generated for us. Alexander Galloway has wonderful images of the internet descriptive and portrayed as networks. There is no such thing as a network graph. The internet, these are just simulations for us to make sense. So we lack behind the machine continually. All we're left to do is look at interfaces. We're driven by the if-then, true-false, switching over. That's not even reality and no longer control. But there's also danger in there. Uh, so there are also limits in there. Machines struggle with paradoxes. The Turing machine cannot run a paradox. The condition of a, of a computer program must that it finishes in a finite time. So there are limits to this. The world that is simulated to us is only a world of what is computable. So the uncomputable forms the limit of this condition. The accident is no longer thermonuclear war alone, but job losses, slavery, virtual reality. Bernard Stiegler quite beautifully talks about future of work, and it's not a pretty sight. We are constantly facing realities that are no longer real. Hyper realities, mutations, a world presented to us that constantly bubbles up. Catherine Hales has written beautifully about this constant incapacity of us to have any contact with any reality anymore. Okay, orientation towards the past, but not only because AI actually has no past, it just runs all the way. And we end up in a captivated state, almost like the animal, that we now are connected 
to a world without being able to look out. So we are the love that no longer sees the open. And the condition, Schleutli has beautifully says, is that we're idiots, willingly so, and that we give ourselves over to distributed cognition all the time. So the way out, the open, is the pause. Computers can't pause. They can only switch. Or as Agamben says, the capacity to not know, to not not think or act. The hesitation, in the hesitation, in the dreaming, in the friendship, in the uncomputable, lies a potential of self-knowing in this final condition. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Mike. I have a very uh, quick question. Do you really think that um, there is such a thing as an organizational self? An organizational self? Yes, because your anthropomorphic approach here is, uh, is based on that. It's, it's based on the fact that we could apply all of this view of the human self on organization. Or, or have I not? Would it, would it be okay to ask that question later? Because I think it, it, it jams quite well with uh, Ted's definitions of units of analysis or, or whatever, and I think you will have a very different version as well. Would you mind if I do Thank you. Okay, Philip. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and uh, organizing this symposium and thanks to everybody for attending. I feel, is it, just tell me when, yeah, no, we start. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, something of a pragmatist turn, pragmatist revival maybe rather, uh, is occurring in organization and management studies. Uh, it occurs in management and organization studies after uh, some years later than, for example, in philosophy, in sociology, in education studies, in uh, legal studies, in semiotics with Umberto Eco. So it would be a question to analyze why somehow later in organization and management studies. But I think it is occurring. And it tries, well, uh, yes. I. Yeah. That's okay. Um, generally, it tries to respond to a question or some que question like, can we and we as citizens and we as scholars contribute to the understanding and transformation of living and situated social experience? I, I will emphasize living and situated. I'm a little embarrassed because Mike said I'm too modest to mention the <laughs> Egos Award <laughs> of my book, and it was too late to change my slides. I know it was in there. <laughs> <laughs> it was in there. So, of course, I will find, uh, well, yes, I will find a way out by saying that I mention it not to boast, of course, about it, but <laughs> to say that I think it's a clear sign of the growing interest of communi uh, academic community for pragmatism. Uh, what is it about? Yes. What is, what is it about when we speak of pragmatism? To explain it, I'll take you back 2,400 years ago uh, to Plateau. I think it's a little provocative in this conference where the buzzwords are big data, artificial intelligence, evidence-based management, to take you 2,400 years back to Plateau. But I like this type of, uh, and, and you used Greek references a lot, so I'm a little more uh, familiar. Uh, Plateau mentions Daedalus, a mythological character who was supposed to have carved statues so perfectly that they could go alive and run away, if not chained to the wall of the temple. And that's why in, in ancient Greece, there were a lot of temples in which there was a statue of a god or a goddess uh, attributed to Daedalus and chained to the wall of the temple. And Plato makes uh, Socrates say, explain, 
it is not worth having one of those statues if it is not fastened because they soon run away. But when fastened up, they are worth a great deal because they are very good statues. And then at this point, Socrates explains that the use of Daedalus statues is a metaphor for experience-based judgment. He says, to what am I referring in this? To experience-based true opinions. These, so long as they stay with us, are a fine possession, like the little statues, but they do not stay for long in our soul, and they run away out of our soul, out of the human soul. In other words, Socrates is here commenting the precariousness and fragility of human judgment. What is accurate, what is relevant today can prove to be erroneous tomorrow because human judgment is submitted to, is contextual and submitted to changing situations and circumstances. Thus, then, so Socrates continues, thus they are of no great value until one makes them fast chained like the other statues. And what are the chains of right to judgment? Socrates responds to that question by saying they are fast with causal reasoning, logic. Once they are fastened with causal reasoning, they turn into knowledge. This is why knowledge is more prized than experience-based right, right opinion. The one transcends the other by its logical chains. Summarizing, I think that in this quote of Socrates and Plato, we have the very basis of the rationalist, idealist, uh, European and Western uh, mainstream of thinking. Uh, knowledge is made of rational abstract representations that chain, consolidate, maintain and generalize truth. And then, thus, they transcend living singular experience. And this was reinforced by some thinkers of our own domain of research, such, such as uh, Herbert Simon, and to some extent, uh, James March or um, Chris Argyris. Uh, we could quote a lot of uh, theoreticians in our domain who to some extent referred to that rationalist view. Here, I wish to insist that rationalism is a doctrine, an ism, not to mistake for rationality and even less for reason. Uh, rationalism as an ism, as a doctrine, can prove dogmatic and irrational, while it can be rational to reject in some situations, to reject rationalism, rationalist views. And that is what pragmatism is about. When is it rational to be rationalist, and when isn't it rational to be rationalist? My suggestion, yes, my suggestion is that despite many critics, rationalism remains a mainstream in organization and management studies. Uh, and that it is important to deconstruct it. And I will explain why I think it is important to deconstruct that rationalist mainstream. And I think that pragmatist ideas can help us a lot to do so. Rationalist mainstream has five pillars. Abstraction from, from singular situations. Mentalism or subjectivism. Organizations behave like rational minds. Representationalism. The pivot, the cornerstone of thinking about organizations is representation. And representation should be understood here with a very strong ontological status. It's not representation as we define in the common life and common language, imaging thought, but uh, representation in rationalism is at the same time the substance of thought. Thinking is only handling rational representations and acting is executing antecedent representations. So in the rationalist view, 
the, the, the concept of representation plays a very important role because it is the bridge between the two, two poles of dualism. It is the bridge between thinking, thinking which is handling representations, and acting which is executing representations. The fourth pillar is information processing. And a synonym of information processing in our field of uh, research, to my mind, is decision making. Decision making, information processing, um, brains, as well as computers, as well as organizations, are viewed as information processors. And last but not least, shareness. Okay, shareness, organizational means shared rather than intersubjective the dynamic and challenging exchange interaction between different views of the world. This view has produced and still produces fantastic results. And I don't claim that uh, rational representations, for example, are, are useless. We need rational representations. But rationalism has serious limit when it faces critical situations, complex, dangerous, threatening, particularly uh, in some historical situations, and I think, uh, yes, well, we, we can skip it. Okay. Uh, that was the case when the pragmatists, thinkers, started writing their work uh, at the end of the 19th century. There was uh, war and violence, American Civil War, industrial and technological revolution, uh, massive migrations, particularly massive migration to North America, and the ecological awareness following Darwin's publication of The Origin of Species, this uh, very strong awareness at the end of the 19th century that human species is ecologically integrated within the general flow of nature. Now, uh, I might claim that maybe we are facing a very similar type of challenge. We, are, we have war and violence, industrial and technological revolution, uh, massive migrations, and a strong ecological awareness. In this type of situation, first, pragmatism appears as a critical type of thought. It rejects the idealist, rationalist tradition. At the same time, for ethical and epistemological reasons. Ethical because pragmatists claim that the intellectuals cannot, remove, cannot, cannot remain in their ivory tower. They have to participate in elaborating adequate responses to those challenges, historical challenges. Epistemologically, because as Kurt Lewin later will mention, the only way to understand social situations is actively experiencing them by transforming them. Yeah. Then pragmatism appears more as a mindset than a system, a system of thinking. And uh, I just emphasize five aspects of that mindset. First of all, situated experience is the ultimate judge. Thought and action start and end in singular situated experience. But not an, in the same experience at the end as at the beginning, of course, but it starts and ends in singular situated experience. Second, representations and theories are very useful, but they are not representational truth. Just instrumental mediations like tools like shovels or hammers to help societies, human societies, to find their ways in the world. Third, ecological thought. Social systems and their environment evolve inseparably together. Fourth, we need to, we need to think processually, i.e. in exploratory, experimental, uh, hypothetical ways because social transformation are moving towards uncertain future, and the way to think about it is experimental and exploratory. Hence, the very important role of the concept of inquiry in uh, pragmatism. And fifth, we need to think relationally, because the meaning of situations emerges not from the information processing of a rational mind, but from the 
permanent relationships between the different organisms and entities participating in situations. I like the quote of Mary Parker Follett, I never react to you, it is I plus you reacting to you plus me. Now, uh, the uh, pragmatist revival is still a fight, a struggle, because what I call irrational rationalism remains very strong. For example, cognitivists are very powerful in the research, of course, in cognitive sciences, that's normal, but also in the definition of public policies. For example, research policies, education policies. I put a quote of Stanislas Dehaene, who is one of the brightest researchers in cognitive sciences in the world, and he says, I reject the idea that social aspects and cognitive sciences require different types of analysis. Social determinants are inscribed in people's brains. So we have here a very clear expression of this uh, rationalism. And uh, a second example is the almost systematic disdain of experience feedback, which precedes big disasters such as space shuttle accidents, oil platform accident, nuclear accident, or big financial scandals. I happen to be an, ex uh, an advisor to the French Nuclear Safety Authority, and I'm always struck by the fact that decision makers still trust rational models much more than human and social feedback of experience. Yeah, conclusion. I think that pragmatism is at the same time humble and ambitious. Humble because for pragmatists, no expert, no decision maker, no scholar owns the truth. Ambitious because for pragmatists, all, and particularly we scholars, but not only we <laughs> scholars, can and should participate in the social understanding and transformation of situations, which I think we need very much today. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are we all okay with instant kind of good? Well, thank you all for staying. I know it's really frozen or freezing cold in here. Um, <laughs> Look, so where should I start? After, you know, three great minds, there is very little to add. So I'll add with something new. And it's time to celebrate. It's time to celebrate lots of things. Firstly, in this room, at six o'clock, we're going to celebrate the Strategizing Activities and Practices Interest Group at our social. So don't venture too far. If you are in need for a drink, I'm sure that in the next two hours we can sort out someone to at least um, increase the air conditioning. We can't. I'm sure, well, we could further lower it, but I think that wouldn't be fun. Um, secondly, I think we should really celebrate social theory, and it has a lot to offer. And um, I will just sort of make a slight um, attempt in adding to um, previous, previous conversations um, that we've just heard. So I'll, on purpose, stay at the surface level. And as you can see in the title, this book is an introduction book. It was really funny that Stuart Clegg actually came to me and said, hey, I think he's serious editors at Edgar Elger and said, um, I think we need a book on practice theory. Would you like to write one? So I thought, sure. Um, but then I thought just introducing something that most of us, I would assume, already know and have read in detail, introducing it at a surface level is not that interesting. So uh, here's my take to introduce something novel about, you know, that social practice theory that, you know, is at the heart of it, uh, that hopefully we can all find somewhat intriguing. And it's interesting because we all prepared our presentations in individually, but there is a very strong commonality. And I will build, and this is genuine by happens chance, I build on what Ted left us with, which was that we need better graduate or training for graduates. We at the University of, um, of Queensland, we decided that we should not revise our non-existent PhD program because there's only eight PhD students and the VC came in and said, you know, it's not revenue driven, so why do it? Um, secondly though, which is um, what, what Ted left us off with, social practice theory and social theory has got 
a lot of good approaches, but the question is, well, how do we actually build on this and where do we go from there? And that's really what I, I was trying to do without being prescriptive, just to provide some overview. Anyway, so, um, I probably should actually. I'll do it. No, I'll, I'll switch it on, that should work. Um, so what is at the heart, right, of what we've heard today is that relationship of phenomenon and theory. And, you know, throughout each presentation, what was really interesting, and, you know, Felipe left us off with, you know, the relation or the, the last quote from the cognitive scientist that actually suggested the arrows in between the phenomenon and the theory are virtually non-existent, right? It's all just a methodological issue. But what I'm trying to, to propose here is that we really need to deeply understand, and that's really the benefit, right? This is why I'm genuine about social theory, and here with social practice theory is just one example of it, it actually has the opportunity to, you know, theorize the phenomenon, and then not fall into the trap as, you know, and this is now a provocation and reflection on us academics and our practice, that we need to let go of the relationship, you know, and this is the, the different dotted lines here between time a and time B, right, whatever that might be, it might be five years, it might be ten years, it might just be one year, to recognize that as theory develops, it actually creates that not parallel relationship between, you know, what and how the theory and the theorizing the representations develop to the origins of the phenomenon that were actually at the, at the heart of that original creation of a representation, right? Representation here really in line um, with with Ted's earlier uh, definition of, it's an abstraction of a phenomenon. Nothing more, a systematic one, but it's, it's just that. And here actually like Bob Heining's um, plenary where he said in his view, institutional theory is actually suffering from exactly not necessarily recognizing that where institutional theory came from, what it's trying to do, and its development at the theoretical level, right? So, um, all right, so I'll just, skip this but really keep keep the middle part so it's it's a genuine i guess just plea for us in general right as academics it's us doing this it's no one else right um to you know recognize that as we are studying in this case robotics i thought it was a pretty cool picture when i punched it into google right to that to recognize that robotics itself right and its relation to um to how we theorize about it is also evolving to recognize that we need therefore to continuously evolve also the abstractions about robotics, not just to say what we know, say, in 2019 about it, will be of the similar sort of quality as in 2025. Anyhow, so this is just a slide to recognize, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, I, again, I know some faces, not, um, um, uh, you know, not all of you, just what social practice theory is and what isn't, um, what it's rejecting and what it offers instead, but, uh, you know, since Ted, Mike, and... Um, and Philippe offered us a lot of details, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over it. But here, and I'm drawing on, on Jorgen, who's in the audience, and a colleague at UQ, I'm drawing on one of his quotes to suggest that what it offers social practice theory is not and cannot just locate it and isolate it to, you know, the different phenomenon here. Which is, you know, and this is kind of what I'm trying to do in this book, right, to just basically bring together an just an illustration of the different manifestations, as I call it, or how the family of theories here with, you know, Ted's work and, and um, Anthony Giddens and Bourdieu's work and so on, how that has actually helped to understand strategy, leadership. And these are just examples, and I'm certainly looking for a better term between the phenomenon-oriented or the theory-oriented, if you like, divisions, because, you know, each of these are silos of some sort, yet they are still trying to actually do something very similar. Anyway, so this is, you know, kind of just taking stock, right? I'm not trying to do more than that, but just taking stock of what has actually, um, or how social practice theory, um, how, yeah, how it manifested in those different conversations. Okay, so here another quote, because I certainly get really annoyed, and therefore I then created a figure in that, you know, I'll share with you in a second about, you know, I was in the Organizational Research Methods Editorial Board uh, meeting just three days ago here because I'm now an editorial board member, so I thought I'll, I'll check it out. So then there was um, someone who obviously, they've got no idea who I am and I don't know where they are because we play in different fields, right, methodologically. So the first question was, oh, I, said, I thought I'd introduce myself as a qualitative researcher. So then the question was, are you micro or are you macro? Right? 
Because micro and macro here, um, as I depicted, that's the way that, you know, and this really comes back in a genuine way to the doctoral and graduate training, how we learn about, or how, you know, even at UQ and other places, you know, how methods are being introduced. And so, in this sort of towards the right, because my um, animation didn't really work, you know, that should have come up a little later, the practices and practices activities distinction just really cuts across any of these layers that are introduced. However, because I don't think we have done a, a good job as a community com to, if you like, put that somewhere, right, somewhere for those micro, macro, indoctrinated, um, let's just call them, no, it's not researchers. call them anything, we'll call them researchers. Um, <laughs> Very diplomatic, thank you, Mike. Um, right, for them to recognize what we are doing and why it is so different, not just from where we're coming from in the way we see the world, but also how we, different it is to actually study the world. Um, anyway, so this is then an attempt to actually sort of suggest what are common ways and, um, if you like, methodological techniques, one could call it, how they can be you like adopted, potentially even misappropriated for the purpose of actually not doing violation to the heart of social theory, the heart of social practice theory. So then what I thought, which um, you know really annoyed me too as um, outgoing chair of the strategizing activities and practices interest group, right, so you can see this is my small manifesto and uh, response to a lot of sort of conversations I had, which is all very nice, but it doesn't publish, right? So what I tried to do, and luckily I had a very um, diligent research assistant, I punched in Giddens, Bourdieu, and um, so if you like the six main um, theorists, right, that are associated with social practice theory, and I punched them into, you know, and looked for AMJ, ASQ, and when they appeared. And so the green, uh, the green bar is the representation of human relations, JMS Oak studies, and then we have AMJ, ASQ, and organization science, because again, it comes back to the do indoctrination, right? Earlier we had the keynote by John Van Manen that, well, if you wanna get tenure, I mean, the reality is, if you're writing a book, you ain't gonna get tenure in a place where you can do research for the next five, 10 years. Okay, so then um, what I did, and unfortunately it doesn't come out that well, is to just provide an actual outline, and it was curious that it was in ASQ that the first, it was Wittgenstein and Heidegger actually, um, who made it into ASQ at the time. Unfortunately, organization studies was only introduced in the 1980s. The point then, and as you can see here over time, is there has been a huge sort of influx, right, both in American journals as well as in European journals, or European affiliated journals of social practice theory which again gave me great confidence to actually suggest, as I did at the introduction, it's genuinely time to celebrate. It's even time to celebrate because then I um, conducted the same sort of search for the Strategic Management Journal and MISQ, the Management of Information Systems Quarterly Journal, right to represent these other disciplines. And you can see that, I mean, in the MISQ, it's really impressive, right, which, um, because it's a very, positivist journal. So like at UQ, we've got one of the founding members of MISQ. I mean, he could not be more arch positivist that you can imagine. However, that journal has opened itself a lot more so than if you like the strategic management journal. If it wasn't for, and the bars do injustice because the numbers are ridiculous, right? So it looks like, whoa, a lot has been published in 2018. That was because there was a special issue on strategy, if you like, practice and process, which, you know, wrapped um, gave it its amazing score of 11 papers. Wow, fantastic, right? If you're like, looking at the average over that 20-year time span at organization studies, the average right now is about 48 papers per year. Anyhow, um, so then what I thought was really interesting to then provide a bit of a map, and then I included even further, um, so I expanded the search, if you like, so I didn't do a trend analysis, because then my funds ran out to pay my um, RA, that's the genuine truth, right, but just to show an illustration in terms of, well, relative, right, so if we had, so previous charts were all based on just frequency counts, right, there were no double, double counts as such, but frequency counts, but then to put it relative to the volume of articles published, in that very same time period per journal, right? To really give it a bit of a, if you like, feel for, well, 
What is the significance? And here again you can see the skew. And then, as I suggested, I included other journals, including Accounting, Accounting Organization Society, the Academy Management Review. And at the bottom, right, at the bottom line here of that, of that last chart that came up, I included OB journals. Because if we want to be genuine, right, about actually get, getting a genuine representation of some sort, we got to be genuine about our inclusion criteria, right? Even when it comes to the journal of OB and the journal of management and even strategic management journal. I mean, I think Jorgen has now a paper with Harry Tsukas in the journal of OB, but maybe because we have a really strong OB representation at UQ, um, who might be on the editorial board? But anyway, I'm just, I'm just, I never asked Jorgen that, so I'm just stipulating some potential of why there has been one paper published in the last 25 years on any of these um, sort of social practice theorists. Two, well done, Jorgen. Um, okay, so where am I going with this? I'm going. Um, I'm going in two two directions. One to suggest that. You know, there is obviously certain outlets that just don't publish it. But um, since we are at the Academy of Management, um, I really wanted to create an evidence base to suggest that if there are, you know, faculty who still live 30 years in the past, to suggest that stuff doesn't get published, it's a question of where to look. It's not a question of it does not get published. Um, which, you know, this is why I thought this frequency count is just really... Um, hopefully getting enough evidence to shove it in the mouths of those that was to suggest that it does not publish. Um, okay, final one, perfect. I'm, you know, where should I end up? I'm ending with point of reflection, just to think about, you know, our own, right, so our own taken for granted assumptions. So yes, we celebrate social theory, social practice theory, but what's next or, you know, how, we, how do we go about, you know, studying the world, if you like, the phenomenon. And, you know, it's really curious that because of the skews that I showed earlier about, you know, the different journals and the different, if you like, ontological assumptions, and I just put it here, um, you know, the, if you like, going back to the functionalist or the interpretive paradigm to suggest, well, we know very little. And the question then is, do we do ourselves a disservice, right, as a discipline? Because we know very little about the phenomenon, if we're thinking about, right, in a genuine way, that we're all interested in, say, strategy or in leadership or in some phenomenon, but if we're coming at it from very different uh, perspectives and not really, I mean, obviously we are sort of the um, the dominate uh, the dominated or you know the the weaker position to suggest, well, can we where shall we go from here, right? If we if we wanted to make change both in in academia and our own profession, but also you know to actually potentially foster change. To the, to the outside world if we're actually not potentially respecting each other's traditions and possibilities to actually recognize, just recognize, right, that we're coming at the phenomenon from a different way which has particular implications for what we would say. So then it's two choices, either we undermine each other, we ignore each other, or potentially something else. Thank you for listening and do not forget to come back here by at least six o'clock. <laughs>
Because we say we go out and study phenomena as there's something out there, and then we represent it somehow. But maybe that's much more complex than that. Right, thanks, Yori. Uh, I'm not going to answer your question. And, but, but you'll see why very quickly. So uh, I should explain why I use the word phenomena. So there's, uh, and this is, has to do with my philosophical background. Um, one, um, I have read a lot of phenomenology. And so the word phenomena is very prominent in phenomenology. Now that's not the reason why I use it though. But, it, but reading those texts sensitized me to, if you want to talk about what the world is populated with, what basic words do you want to use to characterize those, well, that's the question, what are they? So there's a variety of words we can use. Things, objects, entities, phenomena, I'm sure there are more. Facts, say facts. And so, and I find that phenomenon, in a way, is the vaguest of all those terms. Now, part of the thing is, of course, we're talking about words, so we all have intuitions about what they mean. And our intuitions come from a variety of sources. And our intuitions won't agree with each other. So, for instance, I always think of entities as more abstract than objects, but then other people will say, no, that's not how I understand them. But to me, phenomena always seem the vaguest of the terms, and thus the most useful as a result, because you were minimally committing yourself to anything and trying to, I mean, the other alternative to having some word is the point. But then, as Wittgenstein pointed out, it's not clear what you're pointing at. So we need some word. So that's why I use the word phenomenon. There's no big theory or even theoretical idea behind it. Uh, though, of course, phenomenologists do have worked out conceptions of what a phenomenon is. So, I mean, that's why I'm, I won't answer the question, because if, if another way of putting it is I can't answer the question, because there, there are no words. If it's the most basic word to designate what is, Would, I, would you mind if I interject a little bit? We've not got that much time, and you may have to buy the book, Jürgen. That's the part of the <laughs> book. <laughs> but would, would you mind if you asked around a little bit and come back to this? For a few other voices. Robert? <laughs> oh, no. Well, yeah, that's just for show. Please. Yeah. I think this time I got lucky because I found one way, and maybe we want to connect all the contributions. Uh, because you connected your, your uh, work with the Greek thinking, uh, Aristotle has the idea of habit, and you talk about the evolution. So I want to connect uh, this discussion with the evolution of one idea of habit, which you book. You say, uh, pragmatics offers one key concept, habit is one of them. And now the question is really for you, Ted because I read some of your work. And my impression, my interpretation of your work is that habit is not really one of the most powerful concepts for you, right? Set of, of the structure of concepts. And I think uh, in this book, in the last, your last book, you mentioned uh, ha habitus from um, Bordeaux. So my, my point is that we have a challenge and you can make a big contribution to face the challenge because what we need is an interdisciplinary concept of habit. The pragmatists do have a social psychology view of habit, but this a sociological view of habit to change the name, right, to differentiate. But I think uh, that we need this construed uh, redesign, but in a multidisciplinary approach. What do you think? Uh, I, I, I have to think about that. I mean, habit, it is, it's your pointing out habit is concept used in multiple disciplines and there are multiple conceptions of habit. And I guess I have a bit of a cognitive, I don't know how to put it. You see, I like, I mean, habit, I mean, I don't know, in a way, maybe. And I wouldn't know how to do it. Uh, and 
my preference is for concepts like practical understanding, ability, skills, but there's a but the semantic fields of these terms overlap in places. So you know, um, I do think you know you might find some something overarching in that realm, um, but I don't know. I you know I'd have to think more about the, the range of con concepts. Just one word. I think that, uh, at least in pragmatism, the concept of habit is very much related with the concept of mediation. And I would relate it, for example, with the modern or some part of the modern psychology of perception, which says that there is no unmediated perception. Perception is always organized by something. There is an organizing principle of even perception. Of course, of deliberate action and so on, but also of perception. Um, for example, John Bruna or Gestalt theory and so on introduced this idea that even perception is organized by some mediators. And habit is neither what people do, it's not activity, situated activity, it's not representation of activity, it's not an artifact, it's just what makes a situation, uh, for example, a situation of perception or a situation of action uh, related with something else. We are not reinventing the world every time we do something or we perceive something or we think something. And the fact that we don't start from a white page, we don't start from scratch, we always start from some kind of cultural and social predisposition. I think that's the essence of the concept of habit. But habit is, in, as uh, Ted said, is used by other uh, streams of thought in very different, for example, in uh, the routine, organizational routine theory, habit, to some extent, is the equivalent of routine at the individual level, which is not the, the, the definition of pragmatism at all. But I think it plays a very key role in pragmatism because it is this way of overcoming dualism. The dualism of reality, representation, action, thought, habit introduces this social, cultural presence in a very, uh, a very basic situation, which is, for example, perceiving something by the senses. Chacha, is your question still? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? <laughs> no, it's just that I may not have uh, understood your, your argument. Sorry. Uh, so I'll just uh, rephrase my question, which it seemed to me that you, um, what, you um, what you presented to us was, and I really liked the... Um, the first definition that you gave of strategy as a struggle to present itself to itself and to others. Um, but then you lead to uh, authenticity and theories of the self. Um, and I was wondering how you would go back to the organization in the sense that it seemed to me that, yes, these theories work uh, at the individual level, but to make them work at the organization level is another matter. And, um, and I wanted to hear you on, on this. Thanks. It's very, very strange to do both things, sort of carrying microphone and... So, okay, so the question is... Uh, um, uh, it's a really intriguing one, of course, because I, I think if you... Many of these literatures that we tap into and, and, and that book will go for everyone, have got um, an existential aspect to them. Um, the, the human being as a site, perhaps, or as a location from, from which we can move on. But th there's, so if you think of the, what comes out of it, strategy, is not necessarily an individual strategy. So the polis, the guarding of the polis, the city-state, is not an individual affair, but it has to be done through individuals somehow immersing themselves with others. So there are individuals involved, but this is not at all a cognitive or individual affair, and it's not a lading or a, a charging of the 
organization or the, the commonality with individual aspects. I think it would be idiotic to say to suggest that an organization has existential angst. These things are impossible, but the way to think through them is to think through the potential for individuals to act within these concerns. So I'm not sure, not sure if I answer it, but I, I, I don't see the question so pressing in a way because we, we're not making a stronger claim that organizations can have authenticity or can have death or can have a span which underlie many of these kind of concerns all the way through. Mm -hmm. Concept. Oh, 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 yeah, and that's one self. You, you talked about one self, one self, mm -hmm. one self. But is there such a thing as one self? No, of the self, not one self. The one self would assume that it, yeah, that it is an in. Self knowing. That is not an answer. Yes. Self knowing. Mm -hmm. But one the self knowing. Mm -hmm. Well, but this is the point that in all of these approaches, the capacity for self-knowing is precluded. So it is impossible to come to the self. That's, that's sort of the play through which we, we work through. That the, un, the, the uncanny condition is that the self can't know itself, even though it's got the capacity to know itself. So it's the struggle for self-knowing that we find so intriguing. But how do you theorize self, the self? Because you have to, you need to develop that the muscle well, but, but I think this is so. This, if if knowing the self is the strategy, then the struggle to get to the self is the question that we try to pursue. There is no way in any of these forms, apart from where we talk about the pause, where we talk about world making, where we talk about poiesis, in which any form of self, authentic self, can emerge. We, yeah, we can have a beer later. Yeah. We will. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, but I've tried that for a few years and it's not worked, so I'm not particularly. Yes, yeah. Yes. Is there? We're running out of time. Is there? Please. Uh, just on this yeah. question, I just want to recall that uh, there is a processual theory of self, of self as a process, by me, and uh, uh, I relate it with a question about the processual approach to organization. I think. Uh, if you replace organization by the process of organizing, that's just the first step. And the following question is, what does it mean organizing? Who or what organizes what? And then we can have kind of reflective response, something organizing itself, or reciprocal responses, one organizing each other, one organizing another, uh, in a reciprocal and not reflective view. A more interactional view. So there can be a processual and reciprocal definition of self. Is, is yours a really pithy kind of summary of. Please. Oh, I mean, uh, oh no. I'm, I'm, no, Jorgen, you had your time. Yeah, yeah, next. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Sorry. please. Yes, I was just wondering about uh, what would constitute a kind of pure social theory. I was thinking of the example of feminist theory. Is that a All of us, or? Oh, I don't know. Whoever still has energy to work. Yes, well. I, I can say something about that because, I mean, uh, the word, the expression social theory is made of two words. And the theory bit, there could be many forms of theory. And they are defined in some sense by what they're directed towards or about or something. So the question that was posed was you know, what is social theory? So. Uh, but you could say political theory, uh, feminist theory, and then one you know, can start cross-categorizing, and I think it works all kinds of ways. I mean, feminist theory is sometimes social theory, sometimes it's psychological theory, sometimes it's critical theory, sometimes it's political theory. It can be, you know, and a given text can be all of those. We can do more as well later. Okay. <laughs> I think we've run over time a little bit. Thank you all very much. Thank you to the panelists. Thanks a lot for persisting with the temperature. And I'll drink later. Thank you.